In this video, I interview Randall Nickerson, the director of the movie Aerial Phenomenon. The movie recounts and investigates and speaks to the witnesses as children and adults of a reported UAP landing that happened in 1994 in Rua, Zimbabwe at a school called Aerial School. It's a Christian school. And 62 children from that UAP landing drew pictures that demonstrated a high degree of corroboration. And one of the more interesting components of the movie is how they described the beings were moving. They said they were moving slow, f fluidly, and even as if they were on the moon because of a lack of gravitational pull. Although I do recollect one of the witnesses said, but not quite to that extreme. And I found that very interesting because it's like, it's, it's, it's almost certainly not a hoax. Even Mick West does not think it's a hoax. Although Mick West, the prominent UFO skeptic, does not believe that what the children say they saw, they actually saw. He thinks that they just happen to see something, uh, maybe, like a, maybe like a welder with wearing goggles and, and, and like some kind of outfit. And that led them to ascertain that uh, flying saucers landed, beings got out of the craft and so forth. I don't agree with Mick, but you know what? I'm happy to hear his interpretation. But, and, and I didn't really talk to, to Randall about this. You know, it's only a half hour interview and I, I think it's a good interview. But some of the witnesses even recollect uh, receiving telepathic messages. Now, they said that while they were children, shortly after the event took place, and they continue to say that that's what occurred when they were there. So there's a lot of elements that challenge the idea that this was a hoax or a perfect storm. But far be it of me to tell you how to interpret the, the evidence. Uh, that's for you to decide, and you can, you can do that by, by checking out his, his great film that I watched twice and I will watch again. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this interview. And at the end of the interview, I'm going to do an offering for the uh, children that were there that day. And, say they saw non-human intelligence. But uh, we'll pass that bridge when we pass that bridge. Let's go. So Randall, thank you for having, thank you for being on my show. I really uh, appreciated your film. I think it was extremely important. It, it wasn't just fun to watch, but I think it was an important contribution to the narrative that's developing right now, which is at right now, at least the US government is admitting to some extent that the phenomena is real. So the question then becomes, to what extent does it influence our society? When we say that it's real, okay, is it, are we dealing with just unknown technological objects or are there controllers behind these craft? And furthermore, are these controllers engaging our planet? And that brings me to a quote uh, that I will share with you from one of the witnesses from your excellent film. One of the young witnesses, a little girl, she said that she was excited and scared and happy all at the same time from the UFO landing that happened in 1994 at Ariel School. And when John Mack asked why she was happy as part of her experience, she said, because I saw something strange and something peculiar and something nobody had ever seen. And when I heard that, it, it, I found it a little bit humorous because she's a young girl. I doubt she really delved into the UFO literature at all. But in reality, she hasn't seen something nobody has ever seen. In fact, there's been thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people on this planet who have claimed they've had encounters with creatures that looked exactly like what she described. And, th and this brings me to a question that I, ha that I have to ask you, because I know that you aren't the Oprah Winfrey show in 1994. It's not a secret. Your sister was on it, too. Her name is Glenda. And Glenda said that she was abducted, if my notes are correct, from age five. Beings came through her wall. Um, and funny enough, this segment on Oprah Winfrey was in 1994, the same year, I think, that the the Rua Zimbabwe school landing happened that you covered in your film. I think you said that you were 10 years old when it first happened. So my question for you, Randall, and, and, and let me go a little further. I think you said that when your parent, I think, or you said that what you claimed, what you reported was there was a, there was a spaceship outside your bed. It put the dog to sleep and beings went through your walls. That's what you recollect as far as I understand. So my question for you is, 
Are you ex still experiencing contact experiences? Yeah, I don't want to really get into my own story okay. too much. I mean, what, what's out there is out there. And I fair enough. I, I respect that. I respect that. I mean, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I my story has not changed. Uh, I stand by what I spoke. Um, and I just rather would fo rather focus on, you know, the, this these children's and other people's stories, actually, because there's so many other people that have, like you said, have uh, gone through this. God only knows how many. Yeah. And, and the uh, way I seen. the way I see it is your experience, your personal experience is an extension of the of the aerial uh, school experience. To me, they're all connected because they may all have the same uh, species, if you will, whatever this is. Uh, so I'll just continue. So a, a very interesting um, testament that that multiple witnesses had in your film was the way these these creatures moved. They said like no gravitational pull, very fluid and flowy, run, running in slow motion and so forth. You think that the, the the way they perceived these creatures gives any insight to the origin of these creatures at all? Uh, I don't know about the origin. Um, like, do you think maybe it's it's suggestive that they're interdimensional in nature because they were moving in such bizarre ways? What's your take on that? Well, my take is coming from other people, um, more scientists that are, you know, when you can tr control gravity in an extreme way, which it appears these things can do, it can distort time. Um, so that's a good question. I don't know if it says it just says a lot about potentially their technology. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, if they're able to go through walls and they're able to con control gravity, even how they, they maneuver outside of, of the craft, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, what kind of activity was in the sky that was recorded prior to the school landing? Because in your film, it, it's it's spoken about like me stuff was even witnessed prior to the school landing. And it's almost as if the school landing was like a culmination of what was seen prior. Could you go into that a little bit? Yes, that's correct. It, it went on for, uh, according to the BBC reporter, it went on for a week, week and a half uh, before and after Ariel. But Ariel seemed to be, at least as far as we know, the most significant incident um, other, I mean, it was significant to other people, the pilots that saw it, the, you know, other people on the ground that saw it, it was significant to their lives for sure. Um, but the fact that all these um, children had seen it um, and had seen these creatures themselves uh, was, was different, was unique. Uh, there was a man after the day after era who also encountered these creatures at night and, um, that that's not not in the film, but we where, had to what? cut it. We had to cut a lot out. <laughs> where was he when he encountered this creature? These creatures, the, the subsequent to the he, school landing, he was not far away from Aerial School. He was wow. within a mile. Of the school. Amazing, amazing. Okay, um, yeah. so journalist and MUFON coordinator uh, for Africa, Cynthia Hines said, "I'm not all that gullible." But this is to me is a very typical case. And I've handled several, several hundred in South Af Southern Africa. Is she referencing like other school landings? What exactly is she referencing with that statement? Uh, she's referencing other case, not, not school cases, but other cases where uh, people had run into the, not just the, these objects or craft, uh, but, but creatures that have emerged from them. That, that's, yeah. that, that, ama that amazes me. And, and as far as the corroboration that you covered in your amazing film, what components of it lead you to believe, like what, is there, is there any components of that corroboration that particularly stand out that leads you to believe that these children are just not lying? This is not the result of a hoax or a mass delusion or an overactive imagination, but indeed they actually saw creatures that cannot be explained. Um. Yeah, I think it, it, it came from their testimonies and the multiple, multiple testimonies and um, the other witnesses outside of the school um, and 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 to revisiting them as adults to 
you know, hear the same story that they remembered like it was yesterday and uh, not even, not even having seen their own interviews as children, you know, cause there were some on YouTube for a while, but there was a lot that weren't. And I was very interested what those people would say, cause they'd never seen their own interviews. So they, but they repeated the exact same thing they described when they were younger. Great. Have any of the witnesses? So it, 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 yeah, go it ahead. Came down to, sorry. Yeah. It came down to body language. Um, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, observations and I got, I consulted quite a bit on, um, the body language truth aspect of their testimonies, um, which was something I just had to do, which is, uh, was that these people were telling the truth. What, what they're describing was, was very hard to, you know, for a lot of people to comprehend, but they were telling the truth about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think they were too. Um, have any of these witnesses experienced any strain in their romantic relationships from the kind of baggage they had from, from actually having this bizarre experience, like later in their lives? Has it affected their romantic relationships? Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I, didn't, I, I just I've made some observation. Um, I haven't really spoke to them about that, but I, I'm I know that is true. OK. I mean, I've spoken to people, people who've claimed they've, they've had experiences and they, they've told me that uh, it has impacted their relationships, which which I think is really unfortunate. And I, and I think that underscores how this the, the whatever data governments have, I, I do think them coming clean about it, it, it is a moral issue uh, because a lot of these witnesses that have unambiguous experiences they now have to feel like there's something wrong with them. They have to, they're ridiculed. They feel, they feel judged by society. They feel judged by our institutions. And it's like, they're kind of in a jail cell where they can't express something to others that, that, that was potentially traumatic because they're going to be looked at as there's something wrong with them, which is kind of its own tragedy. So do you think that, you know, the American government and other governments have an obligation to break this open and tell us, more with more clarity and less obfuscation that it's real. What's your take on that? Um, I think it's delicate. I think uh, it's a delicate situation. I, um, I think that it's, I think that we're seeing that now. I think we're, we're going to be, we need it at this point in our evolution, I think, and what's going on with our own planet. Um, but I think it is a delicate, something that's, that needs to be brought in slowly and um, with great responsibility. Um, but, I, but I agree with you that a lot of people have suffered for quite a long time by not being believed and uh, just having the subject matter being so ridiculed and uh, misunderstood. Are you familiar with mock UFO landings, crashes that occurred in the United Kingdom since around 2008, often done as a creative writing exercise? Sometimes the kids aren't told it's fictional until later on. Sometimes it involves local police and fire brigade contributing to the illusion. Are you familiar with those cases? And I just want to emphasize those started in 2008, not prior. But what, are you familiar with those? I am very familiar with those because I started my film before that. <laughs> and I was in Africa. I was communicating with people in England about this story in Ariel, at Ariel. I was uh, traveled to Wales to investigate the Broadhaven. And then I, I saw all of a sudden they're doing these, the very thing you're talking about, these exercises with children. I'm like, that's very odd timing. Um, so I was already on this case when I saw that. And I, I, I actually wondered. <laughs> what, what are they preparing for uh, or why is this uh, coming up now? It's very, I, I remember that very well. Good, good research. Do you, do you think there's any hidden motivations like they, because someone in the government knows this is real and they're trying to prepare children for it potentially happening to them. Do you think there's anything to that? I really don't know. I, I don't know. Um, what that would possibly be. 
Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was interesting that there was a, I think there was a sacred burial ground real close to the school. Do you, yeah. uh, do you think there's any connection between them landing where they did in the sacred burial ground, or is that just something that you could never even speculate on? Well, the people that live in those villages believe that, um, the people at aerial school probably do not. <laughs> um, so I don't know what to believe, but, you know, you're dealing with that. That's, that's the, one of the things about this whole phenomena is you deal with different belief systems. Um, yet, uh, we might be dealing with the same thing. Uh, so I don't know exactly, um, what, if that had anything to do with it or not. Um, but people do believe that. And there's people that don't. Yeah. Is there any nuclear connection? Like, is there any nuclear connection to where they landed? Or is there no nuclear connection at all? Like maybe uh, a mine for uranium or anything like that near the school? Uh, yes, two of them. Do you think that has any connection to the, their landing there? Uh, I don't know. It's been suggested that is the case. Um, I don't really know if that's why that happened at the school. Um, or in that area. Um, but it is true that there are, uh, there's a lot of uranium mining going on around in that area. Very close, actually. In a recent interview, um, you spoke about how, or at least it was with George Knapp at Co on Coast to Coast, and he asked you if any of the children had any encounters outside of the aerial school landing. And I think you said yes. So, and I, you know, you didn't want to push the kids and I, and I can respect that, you know, or the, the adults as they are now. But my question to you is, do, do you get the impression that their encounters for, for whatever kid it applies to, because I'm not saying it applies to all of them, but do you get the impression that their subsequent encounters was a result of the school landing or were any of them actually having encounters prior to the school landing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question um you know it's it it was it's only a, a a couple individuals out of many that i've uh spoken with uh so i don't know if it's connected to that i i, I really do not have the answer to that um and i think I, you know hopefully as time goes on more people will tell their own story and, yeah. and if there's more, more to that story i think the world will benefit Absolutely. And I think you did a, the, the world a service by creating this film. And that's kind of what part of why, like you say, it's a devil, delicate situation. And I agree with that. But that's part of why I think the U.S. government needs to be more forthright about this phenomenon, because not only is it leading to people who have had encounters feeling like they can't share their experiences with other people, but it's also it's also uh, creating a roadblock for us to understand what's going on because so many people are reluctant to talk about their experiences and the more information we have, the better we can understand the phenomena, whatever it ultimately is. Uh, what percentage of children saw discs and creatures? Was it most of them? I mean, there was what, 64 witnesses with the school landing? Uh, there were 62 that did drawings. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's not, that was not everybody, but, uh, so people, it depended on where they were on the playground. Um, it was a very, very large, large playground uh, with multiple fields. And uh, people were, children were in different locations. Uh, so they saw different things uh, from where they could see. Um, that's, but there were whatever the, the, the ones that were closest to, to the object that, that had seen it in, in the bush, so to speak, the, the trees, uh, those, are, those are mainly the, the ones that saw the, the, the creature approach them. Because there were, there were places on that playground you could not see that, that area. Because um, I walked it. <laughs> I walked it for days when I first got there to try to just understand uh, what happened there. And, uh, you know, some of the uh, witnesses, some of the children, I should say, uh, heard a buzzing noise, which is interesting because I think that's something other experiencers have heard outside of their experience. And this goes to 
how the very distinct patterns have emerged over the decades, leading to great suspicion that these people all over the globe are not making this up. They're not LARPing. They're not having fantasies. But beyond that, why did some of them, do you think, heard like a flute-like noise and other, other of the children heard more of a buzzing-like noise? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, there were two distinct sounds. They were separate. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, what do you want? What do you want the world to come away with from your film? Uh, just to to begin to look at this subject uh, in a more open minded way, um, so that we as a species can can learn as much as possible where we are, you know, and what's actually going on on this planet. Uh, to be honest with you, I think we broke away from truth a long time ago. And when you do that, no matter what, um, it's going to bite you, <laughs> in, you know, eventually. And I think that's what we're seeing in our world today. And um, I think that this film hopefully will, will bring us, bring people out, bring people forward to come for, there's plenty of people out in this world who could change this um, conversation very quickly because they're so well known or their positions or, or ranks are so high that they could literally change the conversation in a day. Um, and I, I, I just encourage that. That was part of my reasoning too, is to um, get more people to come forward and just be honest and learn so we can learn. I mean, that's really what we have to do. We have to understand what we're dealing with and not, think it's fiction because it's not. Yeah, I don't think it's fiction. Um, I have to ask you this. It's just an interesting question. It's, it's, it's something I've hypothesized on, on to why this is, but why do you think that over all these decades, tens of thousands of witnesses, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions over many decades, some of them having close encounters in their bedroom, some of them seeing uh, objects or craft landing on soil, some of them seeing craft maybe a uh, hundred yards up in the sky, uh, uh, military personnel, all walks of life. Why do you think that at least in the public sector, no smoking gun evidence has ever been acquired of the, of this phenomenon? Because, you know, there's, there's billions of people in this world. We have smartphones, we have security cameras. Um, even a lot of the satellite systems that are orbiting our earth are owned by, by like Elon Musk and, companies that are not necessarily in bed with, with the military industrial complex. So why do you think that this phenomenon is real? It's not fiction. It's here. It's engaging people. And yet we have no smoking gun evidence in the public domain. What's your, what's your take on the answer to that? Uh, I think uh, a lot of people that have had the, the smoking gun um, videos and things like that, uh, they were scared, have been scared to, uh, release that that's part of it i think there has been a lot that's just not been allowed to be filmed and it's only recently that you could take your cell phone even in a you know military aircraft i mean that's i mean you're not supposed to have your own camera equipment but i've seen a few of the th things like that occurring um and we're dealing with something very subtle something that you know people say you know talk about you know, why didn't you take a picture with your cell phone? Well, that's the last thing you're thinking about is getting a picture when you run into something like that. And everybody I've talked to that's that, that has seen that never thought about their phone. They were just, you know, jaw drop, um, full attention on something, you know, that either never seen before. And you're going through your mind like, well, what is this? What, what, you know, <laughs> you run through the, all is this a drone is, you know, all, all the different things. But the, the last thing you think about is um, reaching for a camera. Um, I mean, the best way to capture this, which is we are getting much better at is, you know, recording 24 seven. So you don't have to worry about uh, turning that camera on or off or anything. Um, and that, you know, technological capability is getting just much more um, widespread, but I think that we're going to be seeing quite a bit more 
on the video side. I think there is smoking. I've seen it myself. I mean, I've seen videos that are not public that will, will, will soon be public. Um, and I don't know why they're not showing those, at least on the official level, but I, I think they're trying to take it slow, um, gradually release. Are these government videos that you've seen? No. Private, private no. collection. Correct. And what's their, what's their hesitation to just have a new? It's owned country? by another country. Wow. Can you say the country? I can't. I can't even, I shouldn't even have mentioned it. Uh, but it, but um, it's not, it's not like there's just one. And how, and uh, so that's very interesting. So let me I, ask I, you. Like there, there's plenty of good video, you know, there's plenty of, um, things out there there's a lot of cgi and you know um but there are some solid cases out there that have never been uh what do they call it debunked or or uh, right there's some gr real really great photographs and video um but i think we'll see i, I think we're going to see a lot this year that we've never seen so uh, well, i hope so i hope so okay so those those videos that you were that you saw owned by another country, how compelling would you define them in terms of being unambiguous? Very. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I hope that comes out because Me too. You know, I, I, we're, I think we're at a, I think we're at a place now where en enough, enough is enough. Let's just uh, carry yeah. on with it. That's how I feel. It's like, all right, we're, you know, everybody see a NASA starting their own program. All of a sudden you've got astronauts saying, you know, okay, yeah, we, we've, we believe that it's not from here. Um, yeah, that just the, the, the things that have just come out in the last week are astounding. It just seems like everybody's getting on the page finally, and hopefully we can have an open discussion by August or September. I don't know. I hope it happens that quick, but yeah. not yes. under my control or, or anybody else. I, well, we'll see <laughs> the powers that be. Yeah. And I, I also think that we're dealing with entities that are much more scientifically advanced than us. So we, we don't really know to what extent they can prevent having their fl their flights or their presence um, camouflaged or keeping people from getting the data. We don't we, who knows what kind of technology they have. And that's another thing to factor into why there's not that much uh that's correct. I can I can tell you an example of. I mean, art, artificial intelligence, just as an example. Now, go go for it. What were you going to say? A, a woman who had w was with her father. Um, this was in South Africa, and they recorded. She thought she was recording it on her cell phone. You know, this object that this craft that came very close to both of them, and then when she went back to the phone, uh, her phone, the screen was upside down. You know, it, it had reversed the, the screen on the cell phone and there was no recording there. So somehow their technology interacted with hers in a very unusual way. And she showed me the phone. She's like, this is what happened. This is what, what happened when I started recording. Right after I started, when I looked at the phone, because she didn't, she was staring at that thing. Um, but uh, amazingly, she had... I guess there was more time involved, but she had the presence of mind to start recording it, but she did not get the capture. So, yeah, that's very many stories. That's very compelling. And I mean, if you just look at the, um, <clears throat> the many stories of, of, of objects being seen above ICBM installations, and then they're able to, uh, it appears they're able to turn off, the missiles, I mean, it can, I don't know what kind of technology they're using to get through all that shielding. So if they can turn off nuclear missiles, they can stop your camera from functioning properly as, as far as I can see, from, from what I can tell. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because <laughs> I think turning off nuclear missiles would be a much uh, bigger, bigger problem. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I have any much more questions. Um, I think I'm just going to end it there. I know it's a, it's a quick interview, but I, I sometimes do that. And I think this was a very compelling interview. So um, 
I'm going to give you the stage, Randall. Let the audience know where they can find your work. Yes, right now we're, we uh, released the film on uh, aerialphenomenon.com for now. Uh, let, me, let me start that over. <laughs> so, yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, see the trailer of the film and uh, rent the film uh, at aerialphenomenon.com. We're getting the film out. It's getting really, really great reviews. Thank God. It's been 14 years of work, 14 and a half been a very big part of my life and, and my crew's life. Um, and really glad to have it out and uh, getting the response it is. And it'll, it'll likely be on a major platform uh, within the next two months. Fantastic. So I, I appreciate the interview and I, I appreciate meeting you in the conversation. Oh, the likewise. Question. Likewise. And I think you've done a service for humanity. I, I really believe that. And I will put a link in the description to the website where people can find your film. And uh, thank you very much, Randall. And I wish you a, a good afternoon or a good evening wherever you are. You too. Thanks, uh, Ryan. All right. Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao. So there you have it. My interview with Randall Nickerson. Uh, I may have made an error. I'm not sure how many beings some of the school children say they saw. Was it one or two? I don't know. I, I recommend getting the film to clarify anything like that. And I also recollect that I said, when we pass that bridge, I will make an offering to the children that witnessed the UAP in 1994. And I think that the correct expression is when we cross that bridge. But then again, to err is human. I'm gonna take out my disclosure flute. Anyone that's been watching my channel for a long time knows that on only a few occasions, I have played this flute, which I, and daringly call, or at least I call it now, the Disclosure Flute. Uh, so this is uh, dedicated to the children of Rua Zimbabwe Aerial School that were there at the time and saw potentially, potentially non-human intelligence from somewhere else, even if whether they're somehow aboriginal to the earth, they're time travelers, uh, they're coming from a planetary system. There's a lot of discussion about that. It's a, it's a, it's a big mystery, and I'm not about to tell you what is most probable. Uh, you know, based upon what we know, I would imagine planetary systems. Based upon what we don't know is where it gets very, very uh, mysterious. Uh, I haven't played this in a long time, and uh, for, for the... Uh, children uh, from from the school landing. I apologize if my uh, uh, my yeah and uh, my 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 cringe quotient has been going up lately, as you can probably tell. Uh, but maybe I'll bring out the disclosure flute another time in the future, if if the opportunity is there. Uh, well, this got awkward really fast. Anyways, um, please do not forget to subscribe, and if you'd like to support this channel. You could check out my merch shop where I sell t-shirts. You could become a patron. You could become a YouTube member. You could even just give me a one-time donation and all those possibilities are in the description box below. Or you could just slap a like on this bad boy and I will appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Special thanks to all patrons, YouTube members, those that have bought merch, those that have given me one-time donation. I couldn't do without you. Thank you so much. See you in the next episode.